Hi again. This week we talk about politics and the economy in Chapter 11. This unit is entitled Socioeconomic Forces and Power. And as we go a little deeper into this discussion, you'll see, I think, relatively quick, quickly how power uh, plays into both the politics of not only our land but global politics, as well as the as well as the economy, both here and overseas. First, the definition of power. Power is the ability to get others to do what you want with or without their consent. It can be either legitimate power, which is based on authority, and authority is where people consent to control that is deemed to be right, or power can be illegitimate, controlled by coercion. And in this situation, the power of those who are governed, or rather the acceptance of those who are governed is not supportive of the power. And so you see the difference here, uh, legitimate uh, power, theoretically at least, in our, de in our democratic state in the United States, where uh, individuals in control have been elected to their uh, office and because of our agreement to the Constitution and such, we consent to their control. Whereas in situations of countries where there are dictators or whatever that have seized control, that is considered illegitimate power. And illegitimate power over the long run tends to be unstable. Even those in control oftentimes have control of military forces and such that may keep them in place longer. Over the long run, legitimate power based on authority uh, will be more stable. I believe it was actually Berger who was one of the first writers that you read about in this sem or read from this semester in his introduction to sociology during the first or second week of the course that talked about the government, the state, really being, um, well, really what he wrote about is the violence, as you see here in this slide, that violence is the foundation of any political order. The government is the source of legitimate force in most societies and it, it claims the exclusive right to use violence and to punish. Now, this is a this is kind of a key point, and what it, what he's really telling us here, what the, what this statement says, this is basically the threat of force is the thing that in, that helps a society stay together, and that that threat of force needs to be in the hands of those who are the leaders, the state, the government, whatever, so that uh, the force is applied according to a certain set of rules that everybody in the society agrees with and everything. This is the thing that keeps the society together, this threat of force, so that the police have the authority to use violence to control somebody who is out of control, who is breaking the law, threatening others, those kinds of things. Only in certain situations, of course, but the police do that have that, do have that authority, whereas the private citizen's right to use violence and force is extremely limited and, and actually is quite controversial, as you know, if you follow the news stories in the last uh, few years in particular about the stand your ground laws and those kinds of things. And so According to Berger, the state is the source of legitimate force and that violence is the ultimate foundation for any political order. Now, Weber talked about authority and talked about three different types of authority. Again, remembering authority is legitimate power. And he, he described the three types of authority as being traditional authority, rational legal, and charismatic. In traditional authority, this this uh, power, this uh, this control is based on custom in a society and is associated with the person. And as as a society becomes more industrialized, this type of society or this type of authority uh, tends to decline. There are firm rules of succession in traditional authority systems, so that you always know who's next in line for to take over. Now you think about uh, the less developed nations, perhaps that are that are ruled by tribes. Um, those types of societies really base it's, it's based on traditional authority. There isn't an election to appoint a leader. The leader steps into the role when the last leader expires. Rational legal authority is the type of authority that is based on written rules or the law and is associated not with the person but is associated with the position. And so uh, in, in the cases of traditional authority, um, the person is the well, is, is the point of, of the authority. The authority is that that individual, whereas in in a rational legal system, the position is the person is the uh, entity that that has the authority. In other words, now a person may fill that position, but but it isn't the person that, that is the authority. It's the position that that person holds.
So this tends to increase with industrialization, and again, there tend to be clear rules of succession, uh, sometimes less predictable than, than traditional authority, but, but oftentimes these rules are set up in law for succession and that kind of thing. Now, our system here in the United States, for instance, uh, is you know the, the legal system, so to speak. The government is based upon rational legal kind of authority. So that, for instance, the president may have authority in his role, and yet it isn't because of who he is, it's because of the office that he holds. And that's why a lot of times you'll hear, actually, the president refer to himself as the president rather than, you know, I think. And, and so uh, this is the reason why, because he's really referring to the authority of the office. Charismatic authority, authority is the third type uh, that Weber described, and this is a, a power based on personality, and the, associate, the authority is associated with that personality. There's no rules of succession because, in fact, probably um, when when the personality dies or, or leaves, um, there is no more authority any longer, usually in these kinds of things. And you think about this, uh, the charismatic personalities such as the cult, a cult, for instance, and some of the leaders uh, that are kind of actually infamous, uh, you know, in our history, you know, that uh, led groups of people with their, because they just by force of their personality, more or less. Um, and when, when that person died, you know, the group really kind of, they, no one else can really step in and take care of, or, or take uh take the place of that person who has the charismatic authority. It's interesting um, when you look at the history of, uh, for instance, the civil rights movement, there were two or three very key persons in the civil rights movement, Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King, um, and, and perhaps one or two others, but those are the two, the two names that tend to be associated most strongly with the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. Each of those individuals were assassinated, and, and as those individuals were assassinated, you know, the, the, the organizations behind them, while the organizations continued, um, they never really again had the sort of, um, of momentum behind them and the power behind them that they did, that they did when they had these two people uh, leading them and and uh, for instance now the I think the Southern Christian Leadership Conference which was Martin Luther King's organization continues to exist but as I understand it has become rather bureaucratic and very caught up in itself and like a bureaucracy will do and really isn't uh, out there creating change certainly not like it was in the 50s and the 60s and so so this is kind of what happens sometimes when a charismatic uh, leader uh, leaves the movement or whatever you know the movement the uh, goes away because the authority essentially goes away behind that person the the uh, these organizations behind Martin Luther King and Malcolm X or that they were leading in those days you know now has have probably moved more towards a, a sort of a rational legal kind of an authority system which which just doesn't have that much uh, uh, excitement behind it I suppose now when we talk about governments, it's a different thing from authority, and, and there are different kinds of governments as well that's spelled out in the text. This includes a monarchy, which has an individual that's designated as a king or a queen, a democracy, and there really are different types of democracies. There's either direct democracy or representative democracy. Um, when, when uh, you know, the, the old Greek form of democracy where they got together and they voted, that, that was a true democracy, a direct democracy. Um, the first type of democracy formed by the colonists, in fact, was a direct democracy as well. But over the, over time, uh, our system evolved into a representative democracy so that we send somebody to, to Juno or to the borough assembly or to the school board or to Washington to represent what we believe. We vote for people, hopefully, that we think will believe and that will represent our beliefs. And if, if they don't do a good job, then we won't vote for them again. And so this is a representative democracy. It isn't direct democracy. Um, dictatorship is a, a system of government where one person rules. They're not elected. They're not, but they, they have an iron hand and they rule um, whatever government there is, to, there is. And an oligarchy is a rule by a small group of individuals. Um, the we used to when we were little kids, you know, we used to think about the um, Soviet Union, the old the old Soviet Union, now Russia, and a, 
you know, a number of other republics around Russia as being a dictatorship, but it really was an oligarchy because it was the Communist Party that was running the country. And you could tell that because um, their leaders would turn over. Their leaders could get thrown out of office and were thrown out of office a few times. So even though there was a strong man that looked like he was leading the Soviet Union, in fact, the Communist Party and their secretariat were the ones that were making the decisions. And, and the uh, their leader, their premier, was just uh, representing what they wanted to be said. Um, when you talk about totalitarianism, that's where government has control over everything in life. I mean, everything, what you watch on television, maybe what you wear, uh, certainly, you know, those kinds of things, the style of hair you can wear and, you know, theoretically what you can even think. Um, that's a that's a totalitarian regime and dictatorships and oligarchies are usually uh, well they're not, they're not always totalitarian in nature but when you have a totalitarian country or totalitarian government um, it is almost always a dictatorship or oligarchy we are um, very um, um, intent upon spreading democracy out around the world it seems you know in the united states and certainly over the last uh uh 10 or 12 years you know much of the efforts of uh of our military i think and interventions in different countries has been um to seed democracy where it hadn't been before particularly around the middle east and in southeast asia uh, back in the 1960s and 1970s during our involvement with in vietnam our involvement in vietnam was not successful in terms of that. Um, there still remains many questions as to whether the government that is established in Iraq will be successful over the long run. Um, and uh, certainly the elected government in Afghanistan struggles um, as well. And and so one of the things that this might suggest to us is is that not every nation, every culture, every society around the world is, is uh, best ruled by democracy or is really ready for democracy, so to speak. They don't always work well, these experiments with democracy. Uh, some nations that attempt to extend the vote to the population at large uh, actually succeed at it only rarely. It isn't something that it becomes a, a well-established trend over, over a long period of time. And as, as the U.S. presence, let's say, in Iraq and Afghanistan reduces, you know, only time is going to tell whether that, that uh, effort at establishing democracy in those countries really worked. Um, so some uh, theorists, you know, ask what what conditions promote democracy, and uh, Seymour Lipset identified three factors which play a very important role. And as you look at these factors, um, consider um, if you know anything about the history of Vietnam and what was going on there, or what, if you're paying attention to Iraq or Afghanistan, consider whether or not the conditions are there in these nations or were there in these nations for democracy to get a firm hold first. Uh, a nation with advanced economic development is more likely to be successful in establishing democracy. The larger the middle class, the less likely that they're going to engage in civil disorder. The middle class, uh, by and large, are the individuals who throw the, cast the votes. I mean, they're the largest group of individuals. Certainly the upper class do as well. But the middle class are the largest group that are casting votes. And so uh, if you have a long or large middle class, and this is ones that, you know, relatively well off economically if they're not wealthy they're comfortable um, then your your society is going to be stable and if you have a middle class is, is invested then in the in the successful functioning of that government then democracy is going to be successful they're not going to engage in civil disorder and try to overthrow the government so that's the first the first uh, requirement and I would venture to say that there are very, very small middle classes in any of those three nations that I've been talking about, at least in Vietnam in the 60s. Uh, second, nations that have a balance and diffusion of power when competing groups share in the governing of the state, um, that prevents one, gov one group from dominating. Uh, and so it is... Uh, there, there's more likelihood then that democracy can actually have some kind of effect. You know, if one group in a nation is is dominant, uh, then voting is going to be irrelevant. You know, even if you have other parties, shadow powers. For instance, you know, in in Russia right now, uh, I think you know, I forget what the percentage was that where uh, Val Vladimir Putin was. Uh, elected president for you know actually the third time he was elected but it was such a you know I don't know that he had any meaningful candidate running against him and and although people voted you know I mean really can you say this is a democracy it, it, it really isn't right 
Okay, but uh, in the United States, there are those who would say, well, the Republicans or the Democrats are the group that uh, the groups that that compete for power. And there's a you know s s several like third party, uh, like the Green Party and the Libertarians and those kind of individuals out there also on the edges, you know, agitating for for uh, to change policy and things. Now, some people would say that that shows that we have a balance and diffusion of power. But really, when you really look at that, you know, the the um, the nature of the debate in this nation is very narrow. It's very, very centrist politically. There's, you know, there's the Tea Party that seems to be the extreme right, and there are those that call themselves, you know, very liberals that are on the extreme left. But for the most part, most of our uh, most of our politics occurs around the middle, the center of politics, and so. Some people would say there really isn't uh, a balance of power; that it is one centrist, capitalistic. Um, power group that maintains control of our, our country and that you know were there really competing interests such as a strong socialist party for instance you know or a very strong green party or a strong libertarian party um, it might be a different matter but the Republican and Democrats are really just kind of you know different different sides of the same coin or less so many people think in any event okay uh, in 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 uh, Iraq there were three uh, Groups, three religious groups that uh, basically formed around religion, at least. And let me see if I can remember these. They're the Shiites, the Sunnis, and the Kurds. And the Shiites, if I under remember this correctly, are the dominant religious, political religious group um, of the Muslims in, in around middle the Middle East. And yet the Sunnis, if I remember correctly, Saddam Hussein was a Sunni and. Um, the Sunnis held a lot of power, and so the, there was a lot of uh, lack of stability in, in, in Iraq because of that. But he was a strong man, and so he ruled those three groups and kept those three tribes, let's say, together in such a way that uh, the nation continued to be a nation. But he did that through very um, violent means from, from what we read at least. And so it's not to say that he was a positive leader or that he was a positive force, but he was effective in keeping the nation together. And so when Hussein was toppled from power in Iraq, very predictably, oh, the third group being the Kurds, the Kurds, the Sunnis, and the Shiite Muslims all begin to uh, compete, and, and there were battles w w among them as well. And there was a, it was really quite a, a long effort at getting the government established, and the earliest days of the government uh, post-Hussein there were very, very troubled uh, because of this, this battle between these groups, and these groups really do not have a history of of cooperating with each other and so that's one of the things that again might predict as as the united states sort of influence moves away from iraq and i know we've theoretically we've pulled out of there militarily at least we're, we still have a presence there and and uh, once we pull out of there i think it's going to be interesting to see what becomes of that if that country breaks into three states we saw that happen in in uh, Czechoslovakia in the 1990s, I believe, as well, when Marshal Tito, who was the, the dictator of that area, 1980s even perhaps, um, died, and Czechoslovakia broke broke up. I'm sorry, not Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia broke up into like Serbia and Bosnia, Herzegovina, and other other uh, nations and those nations, though, and again, in many respects, somewhat tribal in nature, at least from our perspective uh, have been warring with each other there were a lot of ethnic wars in in Serbia and Bosnia in the 90s during the Clinton administration and uh, there are some movies about that by the way um, if you're interested a lot of ethnic battles between the different groups and some very very horrible things that occurred you have to wonder if if um, Tito who was by the way uh, identified as a communist his strong hand uh, kept those those battles from occurring and that that destruction from occurring and so in a sense you kind of wonder if some societies do better with dictators I don't know but in any event it's a little bit about that and then finally the in nations with which have a cultural heritage that tolerates dissent and 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 uh, many of the nations where we are trying to establish democracy don't have that heritage at all so these are the three things that we that that uh, uh, Lipset at least believed were the things that um, that uh, make the democracy successful in uh, these these conditions and add to that now again remember the the large uh, supportive middle class being a very important piece of this the more well-to-do a nation the greater the chances that it will sustain democracy
looking at our own political system, and again I say Republicans and Democrats, two sides of the same coin, when you really look at the, the, the continuum of politics around the globe, um, this kind of gives you the demographics, let's say, of the different parties. Uh, older individuals uh, tend to be associated with the Republican Party. One thing that I've, I've noticed in, in Alaska in the 25 years I've been here is, and, and this may have something to do with the fact that uh, um, I'm living on the Kenai Peninsula as well, but but uh, there are many, um, there's a much stronger, I think, force of young Republicans in, in this state than in, than in some other states that I've been in at least, you know. And, um, Republicans tend to be uh, associated with older, uh, more established uh, um, thinking, you know, so middle to so upper social class conservative and less government, whereas Democrats um, tend to be associated with younger individuals, um, demographically speaking, uh, stronger base in, in minority groups. And, and uh, this is uh, in the 2012 election, there's a lot of belief that the fact that uh, the Republicans just didn't do well with minority groups at all was the reason um, that uh, Barack Obama was, or at least one of the reasons why Barack Obama was reelected. More liberal, uh, more female, uh, believes tend to, tends to believe more in government and, and has a focus more upon the working class rather than the upper classes. When you look at the debate that goes on in Congress right now between the Republicans and the Democrats um, over issues about the economy, for instance, the budget, the, you'll notice that uh, the president, the Democrats, are, are pushing for higher taxes and taxing the wealthy. The Republicans are saying no more taxes and let's cut benefits let's cut entitlement programs okay so you can see right there in front of you um, that they're playing out these kind of characteristics that that are traditionally associated with each party the Republicans don't want to increase taxes on the upper class and the middle class because they they tend to be more representative at least the people who, who have more money and and the people who have more money tend to tend to contribute more heavily to Republicans than to Democrats and so they have a, a vested interest in keeping that that uh, section of the economy happy with them because they they finance their campaigns in many respects. Whereas the Democrats, again, you know, uh, more of a focus upon helping individuals that are in need and the working class, again, you know, just kind of as a group, more or less. Uh, uh, so you can kind of see how that debate over the budget is played out uh, in, in right in front of you here. As far as voting goes, if you're a non-Hispanic white, you're in the group that's most likely to vote. Uh, minority groups are less likely to vote. Men and women tend to vote for different presidential candidates. Uh, there are a lot of different qualities, and that's one reason why presidential candidates, knowing that r women make up the larger part of the electorate, those people who actually go to vote, uh, often worry about the female vote. Um, if a person has uh, feels that they have a stake in the system, they're more likely to vote, and this is one reason why probably Caucasians vote more heavily than minorities. Uh, you will see also, as we look at some other slides, that uh, the more money you make, the more likely you are to to um, to vote. And so again, individuals who are in the working class and lower classes don't really feel like the system's working for them and don't feel that commitment um, to the system so much. And so they, they're not as likely to vote. And th there are also a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of beliefs, a lot of complaints about the fact that there are attempts to really deprive these uh, individuals, uh, lower classes and um, minority groups uh, from from getting the vote you know through a lot of different kind of voter voter qual uh, voter qualification voter identification laws and and uh, long lines at the polling places in certain inner city locations those kinds of things so but but in any event the truth is is the more money you make the more likely you are to vote and so again politicians are more inclined to appeal to the middle class and to upper class and really not worry about the vote of the of the those in poverty because those in poverty often don't vote. So who votes for president? And this this uh, goes through the 2008 election, and you can see that uh, um, the older you are, the more likely you are to vote. Um, uh, females and males, uh, roughly the same, but females slightly more likely to vote. Uh, African Americans in in the uh, last election in the 2008 election I should say when Barack Obama was was running as the first African American nominee for president um, actually uh, percentage wise outnumbered uh, Caucasians in that in that particular vote percentage wise but uh, traditionally speaking Caucasians vote more um, uh, Latinos have the lower uh, amount although again there's a lot of um, 
belief that that is changing as as our population skews um, to include more Hispanics in the years ahead. The more education you have, the more likely you are to vote. If you're married, you're more likely to vote. If you're employed, you're more likely to vote. And here you can see real clearly that, um, you know, um, the more money you make, the more likely you are to be in the voting booth. So if you're voting, you're more likely to be older, affluent, and that's relatively speaking, but, you know, have more money than not have, uh, be more educated to be employed, white, female, and married. This isn't about the presidential election. This is really, and, and this is from 2009, so this map will have changed some, but this the red being Republican, the blue being Democratic, kind of gives you a, a picture of the of the uh, composition of the state houses, uh, the state senates and state houses of representative, and which uh, party, you know, has more seats in those in those houses, or which controls those houses. And you can see, I think, the nation's pretty equally divided here. I mean, uh, this this nation, really just doesn't know what it believes right now. That's one way of looking at that at least. Uh, there are a few things that uh, are going on these days that really kind of louse up the idea of rep representative democracy. We send this person to Washington or to Juneau and then people go to work on them there that really have nothing to do with what we want, it's what they want. And these are lobbyists and special interest groups. These are people uh, like political action committees, they call them PACs, uh, who think, uh, you know, have a particular belief in a certain issue and mobilize uh, money, get donations to, to advance that political cause uh, by talking to our representatives in Juneau and Washington. Lobbyists are people that are paid by organizations to influence legislation to work for special interest groups. And sometimes those lobbyists are people who have been in government before, so they have they have connections and they have uh, friendships with people that are that are in the Senate or the House in Juneau or in Washington. Um, and and uh, of course there's a concern that these individuals essentially are buying votes and we we have found in fact in Alaska politics uh, relatively recently the ugly truth that that is true uh, literally speaking and and this <laughs> well I would say the saddest thing is is that the Alaskan politicians were being bought for an incredibly small amount of money and and um, <laughs> I don't mean to make light of this but it, it was almost embarrassing that they that their votes were worth so little to them but it does tell you democracy representative democracy isn't exactly what it's supposed to be political action committees um, uh, were formed to get around the $1,000 contribution rule that there are limits on on what an individual can contribute but but PACs don't have limits and of course the Supreme Court uh, and the the uh, particular uh, name of the case um, is, is escaping me but you know within the last couple of years also ruled that corporations can make donations now in unlimited amounts unreported by the way uh, to political um, uh, campaigns and things and so really um, that that uh, in and of itself probably has had a major change. Uh, major change. I think a Citizens United case is what it was called. Just a major impact on how elections are going to go until that is overturned. And this is something that it's worth your uh, investigation if you're interested in this topic, um, because it it really is going to put the hands of of uh, or put the uh, the outcome of elections in the hands of people with a lot of money. And uh, that certainly, certainly uh, bastardizes the whole democratic election process. And so that's um, that's the good news uh, in uh, politics for the first part of, of chapter 11. And I have another part that's going to talk a little bit about the global uh, economics on a global level and, and some other issues. So uh, if you would, please uh, sign on to the next the next uh, section. Thanks.